Bournemouth University logo and the Times Change logos are shown on screen, with the text Switched Off, Switched On, I Have Had Psychosis by Rick Dyer, Peer Specialist, Dorset Mental Health Forum. This video is part of the Equality and Diversity Outreach work being undertaken at BU. The screen is laid out with a video of Rick on the left hand side and his presentation on the right hand side. The title Mental Health Awareness Week 2014 with the following logos Bournemouth University, Dorset Mental Health Forum, Dorset Healthcare University NHS Foundation Trust, Richmond Fellowship, and Borough of Poole. Hello, everybody. Um, obviously, my name's Rick Dyer. I work for Dorset Mental Health Forum. And today, I'm just going to go over my entry into, through, and hopefully out of psychosis. Um, and at the end, I will be taking questions, if there are any. And within, this, within the, the, the narrative, the, the journey, I, I, I'd like to maybe just hear and listen to some of the things that have gone on. Some of it might be a little bit distressing, some of it might not be, but that depends on, on you guys. Okay. So, Slide changes into the title aims. Rick reads out the points. The aims of today are to talk about my entry into psychosis, to describe my symptoms and how they affected me, to explain what I have done to turn my life around, and to invite a debate about how to approach psychosis. Slide change and reads background. Points are read by the speaker. Okay, a little bit of background. I was diagnosed with depression in the late 80s. Um, and before we start, I'm not going to tell you my age, you can work that out. But in the late 80s, I actually um, became very, very depressed and my life went into a downward spiral. Um, at the time, I didn't know what depression was. I, you know, didn't know what depression was. It, I thought depression was in the 1930s at an event in America. Yeah. And um, within this period, I lost everything. My family, my home. Um, basically, everything I cared for went. And I also, at this time, ended the mental health services because within that period, um, one was a cry for help, one was a serious attempt. I tried to take my life twice. Okay? And that's when the services attached themselves to me, because it's quite serious. But somehow, I got through this period and actually tried to rebuild my life. And it took a while, but I sort of got back on track and started doing the so-called normal things again. I re went back into work, we tried to build a life. Some of the things had gone forever, but my children did come back to me for a little while. And um, I, called, I had a period of what is called stability, or what I thought was stability. And also I learned the value of, of actually self-discovery in this period of time, and actually went on a few courses and tried to find out who I was and took myself to places where I could actually find out my identity. Speaker looks at the computer. And as I said at this point, I believe my troubles were behind me and I just carried on in my life. But then in 19, in, oh, sorry, 2008, after a period of, of Lots of work, running around, uh, a few stresses over money. I, I caught uh, an illness as well. I never can pronounce the name. It's the normal virus, is it? Something like that. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I actually went down this, but it was it was quite a severe case of that. And someone's actually said to me, "You probably had something else." But in this period, um, I became really, really unwell and probably. Didn't sleep or eat for nearly a month. And things started going a little bit strange for me after that, um, in the sense of my behaviour observed by a friend that started to change. And this friend basically said, who knew me from my past as a carer and a friend. Would you like to, could you move in with me so I'll keep an eye on you? 
and I agreed to this because um, at the time I was working up the, up the M3, doing a lot of work, running around. I had a, a construction business. This friend said that she felt she needed to keep an eye on me, take me home with her, her women. And her. As I say, I agreed to this, but things under her observation actually started to get worse. Her seeing me not sleeping, um, pacing the house, getting up very early. I used to get up at five o'clock every day and drive up to work, come back late, not sleep, but get up and, and she said that sometimes she might be sat there looking quite anxious, quite distressed um, and agitated. And it was put to me that I should see a doctor. And initially I said, no, I'm okay. And I carried on working. And then probably a period of time passed and the phone went one day. And it was my local GP who I'd never met and he said to me, Rick, um, what would it take for you to come in and see me? And I actually said, it would take nothing because I'm not coming to see you. And put the phone down. The phone went again about two weeks later and it's the same doctor. And he said, I'll tell you what I do. I clear my surgery and get in a car with your friend, drive up to see me and uh, we can have a chat. Get him off my back, I agreed to do this. So, got into a car, drove to the surgery, and a man to his word, I walked straight in from the car into his room, and we sat down with my friend and carer, who, unbeknown to me, had been taking notes and writing down things about me, which I agreed she could share with him. And within these notes was, um, her observation of my behaviour. She said, lots of nights I'd be walking around the house, listening for things. I'd sometimes shake in the chairs. I'd uh, mentioned to her that I actually felt quite worried about certain things. And I'd also mentioned to her that the house used to sometimes rumble and shake for me. From that meeting with the doctor, I was then taken to St Anne's Hospital and from that meeting, I was there about five hours, but I was actually allowed to go home from that meeting. Went to see my uh, psychiatrist and then from that point on, after seeing the psychiatrist, I was diagnosed with psychotic depression slash bordering on schizophrenia. So, as you can see, I'd had depression before, but now I've got psychotic depression slash bordering on schizophrenia. And they allowed me to go home, which I found out later because I had, hadn't been shown extreme behaviour, but also that I had a caring support system which they felt probably better for me to stay in the house, which I'm thankful for. Um, and then from then on it seemed to just spiral out of control because from this diagnosis I was then medicated um, with Lispiridone, Lanzapine and when times and times <coughs> needed, the eyes are pan. Also in this period, it seemed to, my symptoms seemed to escalate. Um, Slide title reads symptoms. The points are read out by the speaker. And again, the stuff, what I'd been going through before seemed to get bigger. The lights coming through the windows, it seemed like moving pictures. Lots of sounds and noises and the rumblings and as I said the house seemed to shake. Within this as well I would drop into periods where I was absolutely petrified and terrified and very, very scared. And this is when sometimes a crisis team would have to be called in to come out to see me. 
and I'd be deflated down again in the <coughs> three or four days, high, what, you know, upset, distressed. They'd come out, I'd be all right for three weeks, and then with all this going on again, they'd come out again, and this just exactly got worse and worse and worse. And I think within a period of a year, I think I had about seven or eight interventions of crisis too. But I still stayed within the house, um, you know, basically living in the fear of the house and all my surroundings, what was going on. Slide bullet points change. These are also read out by the speaker. But within this period as well, I'd now, for the first year, I basically stopped going out, but I carried on working as well, believe it or not, with all the medication and everything else. Um, going to work, feeling like that. The guys at work were very supportive, but not understanding about me, what was actually going on. They just, you know, you all right, Vic? But an event happened at work, which I've not put on there, which actually really pulled the hammer down. And I don't know if any of you guys know about laser lights and strobe lights to get dimensions. I was in all the shop, setting out the house, not feeling very well, and someone had set up, similar to that tripod, and the lights were going around. And I'm working, and I actually saw the lights. And I actually just became paralyzed, just collapsed into the trench. And what happened was, the symptoms I'd been getting in the house seemed to have followed me up the M3. From that point on, I was then taken home in a very bad state, and I then didn't leave my house for nearly two years. And within that, lots of other things happened. And yes, literally, I, I went to the house and I basically didn't go out for nearly two years. And all those things I spoke about before just really got big, the acute. I really, really was deeply paranoid, had a real, real fear and anxiety around that I'd actually upset my neighbours with my behaviour and, and that at some point I might be extracted out of the house and taken away or got rid of. And it all compounded on me as, as in this illness. And um, I could actually feel myself as well physically not very happy because I'd actually put on nearly four stone in weight. Um, I wasn't doing good things around my food. Uh, lots of sugar, lots of salts, lots of drinks, fizzy drinks. You, um, I'd jump into that when you're not well when you're in, a, in a, a state of situations where you're not actually functioning correctly, you're not actually taking care of yourself that well, you don't, you don't know how to. So you, you do things which you probably wouldn't do if you were functioning normally. So um, it just got you know, worse and worse. And I actually just stopped doing. Most of the time I'd be in the house, not moving about hearing stuff going on, not sleeping very much, and as I said before, sleep, as a, as a, and a lot of you guys know this, sleep is a massive thing, and I wasn't sleeping very much at all throughout this period. For nearly two and a half years, I hardly slept. So, it was having a massive impact. And I, I also, at some point within that as well, I'd worked out that maybe the medication wasn't doing me any favours either, but I had to take medication because it would, it would help me to a certain extent. And within that as well, I would self-medicate because sometimes when you're, you're fully in one of your episodes, you just want to sleep. You just want to get yourself down to a position where you can just chill out and rest the body. So I would take the odd extra of the I would take a couple more do pan just to get me down. Um, and again, I didn't know I shouldn't be. You do things when you're in a, in a situation where you need to get some relief. Side title switching back on with the points, I had enough. It was too distressing to live in this state, so you contemplate how to end it. Point, but I don't want to be finished. I want to find another way. Point, I decided to attempt to save myself by going into myself. I became internal and realised some of the answers I had to find myself. 
I accepted my situation and decided to help myself in any way possible. I seized control and power in small steps. I realised my compassion for myself had been lost. I had to regain it. But, um, as I said, this went on for quite some time, two years nearly, and um, I was really fed up with it. I had no life, uh, and I was actually impacting, I wasn't seeing any friends and family, and, and I want to just talk about this, this bit here. The speaker references the first point and the, and the words contemplate how to end it. Contemplate how to end it. Now, in, when I became, when I was depressed in the early, late 80s, that was a, a, I suppose, I look back on it now and look at that as a bit of a sulking. Everything's gone wrong, I don't want to be around because my life's finished. And I, was, I was probably feeling sorry for myself. And that's why I probably decided to maybe do something a bit extreme and get go. But this second contemplation of it was because of the living hell I was in. I just didn't envisage a future and life beyond the illness. So part of me worked out, do I want to be living for the next six months, ten years like this? No, I don't. And I think that's the, that's the, the, the people have said to me what was the crunch point in what was the turning point. And I think it was this period because I actually didn't want to be around living in this world I had. That's where I wanted to go. Um, and uh, I always remember I woke up one day downstairs on one of our on the couch and I'd been shaking all night thinking that that was the night that I was going to probably be extracted from the house and got rid of. And I always remember my care friend came down and she said all she saw was this white duvet and this quivering, shaking mass. She peeled it back and I was drenched in sweat. She said, you looked like a frightened, besieged thing. And within that period, I realised then that if I didn't do something, I probably wasn't going to be around for very long. And somehow, I made a decision after that event to do something. And um, what had happened as well is, in between all this, I've been seeing my psychiatrist every two or three months. Um, and I don't mind saying it, I had a CPN um, who would come round intermittently and my psychiatrist would just say, carry on, take the pills. She would come round and not be very, um, not very, you know, not a lot of input really. Um, anyway, within this visit to the psychiatrist one day, he actually came out with a completely different viewpoint. He actually turned up and said to me, Rick, we're not getting any, anywhere, are we? And I went, no, we're not. I'm not going anywhere, you're not going anywhere, and I am a bit sick of this. And then he used, well, I used the term, but he basically said, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to bounce you upstairs to my boss. I'm going to get someone else to take a look at you. I agreed to this, because he wasn't, and I wasn't going anymore, so I actually agreed to this. Within a couple of weeks of that meeting, I actually then went to see a consultant at Hanneman House, who's the, uh, the crisis team down there. And, um... Slide reads, how did I do it? I had to find a safe place, a haven just to be, a unique spot where I could relax, rest and recharge. This space was somewhere in my house. I learnt useful self-management techniques using my first depressive episode as a guide. I decided to ground myself in the, new, in the now and take permission from myself to do things in small steps. I made small steps, changing my life in all aspects. Diet, sleeping, exercise were all important as I slowly rebuilt myself. I gave myself permission to negotiate my personal power with my world and the people in it.
I basically walked into a room and there was a guy sat down behind the table. He's looked up and he's gone, Rick, what are you doing here? And I've looked at him and I've gone, I won't say his name, but blah, blah, what are you doing there? I knew this man. I knew this man from eight to ten years earlier in my life when I used to coach his children at squash. I'd had dinner around his house. I'd actually helped him tinker with some of these cars because he used to be into repairing cars. And he's looked at me and he said, what the hell has happened here? And I've gone, and he's got my notes and he says, said to me, psychotic depression, all in all schizophrenia. And what you've done, not a word of a lie, you put a pen straight through schizophrenia. You haven't got schizophrenia at all. Because you weren't exuding this behaviour and you weren't doing this, I know you. You weren't <coughs> doing this before, I'm going to get, actually get rid of that label. And that's what he called it. So I'm going to get rid of it. And actually, I had a bit of a, because I'd read the, no, I don't, I'm not a fan of the, the normal media tabloids, but I'd read in The Guardian and, the, and the, all the other papers about the mail about schizophrenia and it's now attached to me, so it's quite good when it's gone off you. You have got psychotic depression, that's no doubt. Then you put my notes down, basically put the notes down. And what he done then was he said, and he said come out with something which is again quite powerful. What are we, you, going to do about this? And then we sat down, we formulated a plan. So I'm sat on one side of the table, he sat on the other side of the table, and we had a chat. And what we said, we spoke about initially was medication. What meds do you want? Nanzapine, Mispiridone, Diazepam, blah, blah, blah. Okay. How would you feel if we started getting you off these? Because I said to him, I think these are big bad meds. And he said, they are big bad meds. And you're taking a lot of them. And I think it's actually having an impact. And I knew it had an impact on me. So how would you be to get you off these pills? To weed you off them slowly and to get you onto an antidepressant with a maybe a sleeping pill thrown in there? I agreed to that. One box, meds looked at. Triggers. What are your triggers? What's, what do you think is causing some of these problems? I know there's a massive lack of sleep. I know you've not been taking care of business. <coughs> don't. And I actually said this to him, I'm not taking care of business because when you're unwell, you don't. I'd actually, by now, three or four years within this state, had built up massive dysfunctionality around my finances. Um, I was in a lot of money trouble and I didn't, didn't even realise it realise it and it was suggested that maybe I might need to go bankrupt because what else has been happening in my other life is the letters and all this stuff and all the people were queuing up to come down on me over that so it's actually put to me about bankruptcy again I didn't like the sound of that but for it's an option to think about that and as we move on I did actually go bankrupt I had to which took a lot away a lot of stress believe it or not um, you're sleeping. You don't sleep, do you, much? I said, no, I've got not. But he actually then spoke about sleep hygiene, about trying to look at some of the reasons as to why I wasn't sleeping and to actually address that. So we, we create another box, triggers, get rid of some of them, look at them. What about, uh, what are you actually doing now? What do you do? And I'm in front of him. Bear in mind, he saw me years ago when I used to be a squash player, squash coach. And now I'm this lump of whatever. And I said, I don't do anything. I don't, I don't go out. I can't go out. Would you be prepared to, with your care friend, start doing small little walks? Um, but to help with that, we might just 
give you some relief to help now. Would you be prepared to do some CBT? Which I agreed to. So I agreed to these things as well. And then, so that went into a box of actually starting to do something. Then we looked at the facts of um, my food and my diet, which was bad. Well, I didn't think it was bad, it's, it was bad. Um, so we agreed, I agreed with him and then agreed with my friend Kerr to maybe start to cut out the sugar, cut out the salt, cut out the fizzy drinks, cut out basically the rubbish and try to put me onto a much healthier diet. And I left his office and I kicked these things in pretty well straight away. Very slowly though, took about 18 months of addressing it back. Um, and uh, I got on with it really. Went and saw him. I went and saw him three months after that and reported back to him and I'd, I'd reduced my risperidones and reduced them. Just went through the next period of just reducing, doing more bigger walks, CBT, getting out more. I stretched the walks probably into a, you know, half an hour. Slide title reads important factors. Bullet points read out by the speaker. But, so, what I would say though, in this period, around that period, is I've actually regained and reattached myself to who I was. Where i had been lost and not doing things, I actually then kicked back into it. Um, and I was able to, with support and help, attach to my values and the positive elements of my personality. When I was unwell, when you're unwell, you're not doing those things. Your self-esteem is low, your confidence is low, you think you're probably the worst thing walking on the planet, and you lose sight of your core essence. You can do, not everyone does, but lots of people I should imagine, and I did, lose sight of my core essence. And I didn't like myself either for all this, so. And one of the things I did attach to, which from my <coughs> life beforehand, I'd always, and, and without being rude, I, I'm not really fussed about other people. You know, people have their values, but that's theirs. My values and my core essence are mine. And I used to some, think to myself that I basically came from a place of integrity around me. And I felt that through my illness, I'd lost that. I'd lost integrity around who I was. So when I started to turn the corner, and things started to be dressed backwards and more lucid, rational thinking and behaviour started to come in. That was one of the things I really, really went after, was to find, refine the integrity around me again. And, um, and I did, I just went on that journey. Now, within all this, what I'm saying, what had happened and pushed me to a point of moving forward was I like to think there was an acceptance around what was going on for me, but there was also me taking some a certain amount of responsibility around me. And there's also a point of like, I've got to go and do, I've got to get on with this, get on with it now. And with the elements from seeing sort of the consultant, me moving forward, I really, really, within quite a short space of time, started to see a positive shift. The interventions with the crisis team actually got less and less. My sleep patterns got better. Um, Side title reads, Why am I now? I have not had any psychotic symptoms for four years. My depression is under control and I no longer have a problem. I have a healthy sleep pattern which is very important to my well-being. I am in the best possible shape physically throughout my healthy living. Mentally, I am healthy too and function well in my life and activities. I have rebuilt a rich and purposeful life with hope and meaning. I have regained the compassion for myself I had lost through illness. My, um, my anxiety levels got better. The CBT helped the belief system started to be cracked, you know, into little extent, but it's better than no extent. And I was able to then basically fill some of the voids with positive stuff. The weight started to come off. 
um, better food. So basically what I'm saying is all the elements I addressed about me, put them all in and then applied them. And I haven't written it down there, but I call it selfless. Not being selfish, but selfless. And selfless to me is I have to find and be myself at whatever cost. And within that, I had to negotiate with my care friend, negotiate with my family and friends about this journey I had to go on for self, for Rick. And I've done this with, with professionals, as I said, with, with the, the most important people around me, because I had to go and find out and save and be Rick. And I've done it through just applying all these things around me. Now, I've been accused, and I, it doesn't matter. I've actually been accused at this period of being selfish. No, it's not selfish. If you'd been to where I've been, and you get an opportunity or a gateway to actually do something about yourself, you do it. And if people around you perceive that as being whatever, that's their problem. And, and, I, and I truly believe that, you know, and that's without getting too spicy about that. That's what I really do believe that you have to. If you've reached a point in your life and you've got the opportunity to turn it around and, and save it, you will do it. Human instinct. You know, I could have taken the other option. And I didn't. So, I basically rebuilt my life, actually. Um, and I now have a, a much more great acceptance and appreciation of, of life and of myself as well. Um, I'm back coaching again. I'm physically fit again. Um, that's probably five years now. I haven't had an episode for that long. And even now, I, things might get a bit distorted, but they pass very quickly. I don't actually slide into stuff anymore. It's um, just a little thought. I'm still on medication. I take an antidepressant every day. Um, but what I do now, and what I've learned to do, is self-manage. It's become a, a lifestyle thing, but it's become just part of me. I take care of all the, the, the good things I should be taking care of so that Rick stays functional and in a place of, of moving. Um, and yeah, I've actually, you know, it might not seem that I'm actually in a really, really good place now, a much more purposeful, rich place. Um, and my life's got hope and meaning again. Slide title read, what do I do now? The bullet points spread out by the speaker. And what I do now is I actually, I do a little bit of work with the Daughter Mental Health Forum. Hence, I'm here. And I've been with the forum now nearly four years, three and a half, four years. And I've, uh, I promote recovery really. I, I go around talking about my journey, what I've done around me getting to where I am now. And um, I teach on how on the, the REC, the Recovery Education Centre. Um, I'm co lead on work around BME agenda. I'm passionate about equality and inequalities and um, and within the forum, I've been given the platform to, do, to push that because um, without getting into some rant, we're at a critical time on this planet about, uh, and I've actually applied it to myself, and I just wish we'd apply it to ourselves as well, about tolerance, understanding around each, yourself and each other. And that gives me a, uh, a place to go where I'm actually passionate about disadvantaged people, passionate about people who uh, are on the wrong end of systems and society when most of it isn't their fault. And so I do a lot of work around that. Um, I co-produce and deliver training and learning <coughs> work with the NA local NHS Trust. I'm actually, because I'm passionate about recovery as well, I, 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 I go back to acute units and 
I like that they are um, getting down and dirty with real people and patients on walls and doing work around them. Um, you know, that's that's my real passion. And I, I feel that with the journey I've had, I'm, I've got something to offer in that sense. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm content as best I can. I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm never fully contented, but that's life. Um, and uh, I'm proud that I've actually got through the suffering and the pain, and, and I've actually got to a place in my life where I can move on with it. And uh, my family, or my family, my two daughters are back in my life. I, you know, I love Dorset. I live in Dorset. I've lived here many years, and I'm just proud that of myself and for the people around me that I've actually got to this point from the journey before. Slide read conclusions. By entering a space of terrible distress and getting through it, I have gained a greater and better insight into who I am. I have a different perspective of life now. I have a much higher state of acceptance, tolerance and understanding around myself. I have realised my journey to where I am now has been a long and difficult one, but by seizing the power of me to overcome it and using the essence of me with support, it has brought me to where I am now. You know, so from distressing times and not a good space and not wanting to be here and not actually having any hope or purpose or reasons to be here, um, I've got to this point and uh, that's where I am now. And that's my talk. Thank you. If you would like to find out more about the dignity of diversity and equality work at the university, please contact Dr. James Palfman K, Equality and Diversity Advisor, email diversity at bournemouth.ac.uk, www.bournemouth.ac.uk forward slash diversity. The Bournemouth University logo is shown on screen.